Shakardev, Grandmasters. Spirituality is so misunderstood. Truth is human life, everything is so misunderstood, it's ridiculous. If you walk into a beautiful home, I mean like Steven Spielberg or Bill Gates' home or something, you've been invited to this amazing party, and from the moment you walk in the front door, you you notice there's a small 15-inch TV screen in the corner. It just catches your eye for a moment. It's just a flat screen. But then you notice there's something on it that catches your attention. So you start to slow down. You don't walk past it. Why don't you walk past it? Because it caught your attention. It caught your awareness. So now you become aware of this little flat screen TV and not aware of everything else. Nothing wrong with that. That's what awareness does. It focuses on what it's aware of. But since your consciousness is who you are, your awareness is the only thing you're experiencing, if you start to become aware of that screen, and other things are not distracting you, but it is distracting you, that word distracting you is very spiritual. What does distracting mean? Your awareness gets drawn towards something. So in this case, your awareness got drawn toward this screen. Now what happens if what comes on that screen is the most interesting thing to you personally, like it's something about your mother's childhood and you never met your mother and all of a sudden you had heard something and somehow this thing on the screen is some movie that got made that you knew nothing about and OMG, all of a sudden, all of your awareness, I mean all, 100% of this stuff called awareness, consciousness, is focused on this screen. And let's say it's a very long movie, you know, like six hours. Don't laugh because I'm going to say six years next, or 60 years. So for six hours or six, whatever it is, you are focused on that screen. There's nothing wrong with that. Your awareness is going to be aware of something. You are an aware being. Like a flashlight shines, it doesn't illumine everything. It just illumines what it shines on. It doesn't mean the other stuff doesn't exist. It just means there is a limit to how that light falls upon objects. So, as you know yourself now, your consciousness, if it is focused completely on one object, that's all there is in your universe. You're completely fixated, focused on that object. You could get so absorbed that people could be calling you, that somebody could touch you. You become so absorbed in your awareness of that object that your awareness does not get taken off the object even though these fairly normal things are taking place. People are talking, people are calling you, there's a smell of food, there's music playing. It doesn't distract you. Why? Because you are completely absorbed. That's such a good word, absorbed. Your awareness is absorbed in this one object. That is to spirituality. That's a normal state of a human being. I'll prove that to you. As silly as that seems, that you would walk in that beautiful house And from the moment you walk in, the only thing you see is that TV screen. And now when it's time to leave, you leave, and they say, how was your visit to Spielberg's house? I saw this movie. What were they serving? I don't know. I saw this movie. Were they serving something? I don't know. I didn't see anything. What about the architecture? I didn't see anything. And you didn't see anything, did you? You were there, but you didn't see anything. It was there, but you didn't see anything. Because you only experience where your awareness is. I don't have to be a scientist to tell you that, do I? You only experience what comes into your consciousness, what affects or focuses your consciousness, all right? So what has that got to do with us? Listen to me. Don't rush. Before we're done, you'll see this. That TV screen you're staring at is your mind. I swear to you, someday you will see that. You walked into this room of life, and there's all kinds of things here. Planets, stars, other people and colors and shapes. and You don't really see them. What you see is what your mind says about them. Your mind immediately has something to say about every single thing that comes in. I like it. I don't like it. Boy, she's tall. She's taller than my sister. I thought my sister was tall. I wonder if she plays volleyball. Just on and on and on. There is this constant reaction going on in this thing called mind about what you are supposed to be or capable of experiencing. 
And since you focus on your mind, and you have to understand that, it's like we're so focused on our mind, we don't even know we have one. I've literally had people tell me, I don't have a voice going inside my head. I watch, there's nobody talking in there. I, he says, there's nobody talking in here. I don't know what he's talking about. All right? Your mind is constantly active. Your consciousness is capable of being aware of a number of different things. One, what comes in through your senses. There's a world out there. It's got nothing to do with you. There's a world out there. You didn't make it. It's been there for 13.8 billion years. It's emanating from the quantum field. Look at it any way you want. It's not yours, is it? <laughs> right? It's just there. And it comes in through your senses. Why? Because that's the nature of things. Your senses are made in such a way that they pick up or are sensitive. That's why they're called senses. They're receptive to the vibrations, the electromagnetic spectrum, whatever it is, that's coming in. And then it comes in and it stimulates your mind. That's what it's supposed to do. If you didn't have a mind, you wouldn't be able to see what's out there. If you don't have a flat screen TV, you can't see the ball game in San Francisco. It comes in and it paints, it renders the picture within your mind. You know you can visualize in your mind. So things come in and then you see them in there. So the first thing that you become conscious of, that you're capable of being conscious of, is what is coming in through your senses, is the world in front of you, which is not very much. I've discussed that with you. How much of the world is in front of you versus what's not in front of you at any given moment? There's not a number small enough for that, is there? Right? That's all you experience. Right? What else is going on in Gainesville other than this? Every single place, how many square feet this is, every single square footage everywhere has stuff going on. This is just what you're experiencing. Fine. That's what comes in through your mind. And it's also going on all the rest of Florida and the whole world and also the universe. So you're picking up almost nothing. We're going to get to that in a moment. You understand that? Be honest. This is what's called humility. Do you understand you don't know anything? You don't know anything. You only know the tiny little bit that came in when you happen to be focusing on that area. You can't argue with me that you're seeing the rest because you're not. You're not hearing it, you're not seeing it, you know nothing about it. So the only data you have is this minuscule amount, and it's so minuscule it's ridiculous, it's like point oh 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 one amount of what's actually happening. That comes in, and as you walk through life, that's all you pick up each moment is that. So you're missing everything. So at any given moment, from your senses, you are taking in just what's in front of you. That's one way to look at it. It seems important. I want you to pay attention to what's not in front of you because you're not taking that in, which is bigger. Not even funny, is it? So that's one thing you take in, this meaningless amount of data of the moment that's in front of you. It comes in, and by all means, it stimulates your mind, and you experience it. That's one thing that the consciousness gets distracted by, becomes aware of, call it whatever you want. It's an object of consciousness. There's consciousness, awareness of being, then there's this object of consciousness. It doesn't matter what it is, a man, a woman, a car, a house, a hut. It's a thing. It's just a thing that's out there, and it happens to be the thing that's in front of you right now. There are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of things that are going on that are not in front of you. Period. That's how a wise being sees things. We'll get there in a moment. So one thing you experience that you're aware of is the world that comes in. But that's not all you experience. The other thing you experience are these things called emotions. Does anybody know anything about that? They're not out here. You know, that's what your emotions somebody else doesn't see. They're yours. Private stock. But what are emotions? God, you can lose yourself. If people write books, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you know. Which one of you don't know what an emotion is? You know what an emotion is, don't you? Is it out here where her toe is? Is it like that that kind of thing? You can touch it, smell it, taste it, feel it? No. It is something that goes on inside of you, wherever that is, but it's inside of you, and the consciousness experiences it. Is it the same awareness of being that notices an emotion is coming up as the awareness of being that is seeing the outside world is unfolding in front of you? Or there are multiple consciousnesses and they don't know each other. There's just one. You can be looking at something, you see it, and then you feel an emotion comes up. There can be nice emotions, there can be not nice emotions. So what? There can be big houses, there can be little houses, there can be big birds, little birds. Those are things that are out there. They're part of reality. They're coming in through your senses and you experience them. I like to say, and I know you don't like it, that it's none of your business. (laughs) It's none of your business. What? What's out there? 
It's been there for 13.8 billion years. It took 13.8 billion years for the moment in front of you to get there. How long have you been around? It's going on everywhere you're not. How could you possibly say it has something to do with you? It has absolutely nothing to do with you. It has to do with God. It has to do with science. I don't care. Same to me. The important part is not you. It has nothing to do with you. Turn to the right. You see something different. Turn to the left. You see something different. I don't understand. If you turn there, then it has something to do with you. It wasn't there before you looked. Everywhere is it's going on. It has nothing to do with you, but what's in front of you somehow is magic. Somehow it's magic. It has something to do with you because it's in front of you. Come on, that seems silly, doesn't it? It's just you didn't make it. It's emanating from the quarks and leptons and bosons. Its, it's behavior is based on all of its past experiences, which you know nothing about. You weren't around. It's a thing in the universe. Everything is a thing in the universe. And it comes in through your senses and you experience it. However, there's another thing you experience. These emotions. Where do they come from? They come from your heart. You know that. If you point to your emotions, you, oh my God, I'm having so much trouble with this. You feel it emanating from your heart. And it does emanate from your heart. Not your physical heart, but it emanates from that area of your energy system. What is an emotion? It is a vibration, not a physical vibration, but it is a vibration that your consciousness is capable of experiencing. And so you can feel love, and so you can feel anxiety, so you can feel self-consciousness, you can feel embarrassment. I can give you a whole list of emotions, can't I? And you all know what I mean. That's what's so neat. I can't point to them, I can't touch them, but when I say those words, every one of you know exactly what they mean. You know what jealousy feels like? That's right. Does everyone know what jealousy feels like? You know what insecurity feels like? Ever feel embarrassed? Ever feel self-conscious? How do you know? That's, that's silly, because I'm in here, I'm conscious, and that's what I'm conscious of, that there's this thing that pops up in the universe, and blah, <laughs> there it is. Okay, good. That's the second thing that can distract you. Can your emotions distract you? <laughs> okay, if you're focusing on something, and all of a sudden some emotion comes up, I wonder which one you're focusing on now, the book you're reading or the emotion that came up? I'm having a conversation with you. We're talking about something. All of a sudden, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just talking, but I hit something. I swear I didn't try to. All right, just, I can't even see it. How could I be my fault? I'm just talking. I didn't know your brother died when you were young and I mentioned your brother. All right, all of a sudden, you're not hearing me anymore, are you? You're not hearing a word I'm saying. It's like in the background, there's something. There's just all this emotion starts coming up, yes or no. It absorbs and distracts your consciousness the same as that TV screen when you walk in Spielberg's house. There was a whole house. You didn't see it. There's a whole world going on. You don't see it because that emotion pulled you in there. All right. There is another thing. It's bad enough. There's this whole world coming in, distracting you, You're holding your consciousness. There are these emotions that pop up periodically, or maybe some of them stay, and they are distracting you. And then there's this other thing. Oh, yeah, thoughts. Does anybody have those? You are not your thoughts. You are not your thoughts. You are the experiencer of your thoughts, just like you are not your emotions. You are the experiencer of your emotions. You are not the tambourine. You are observing, experiencing the tambourine. They're all exactly the same. They are objects of consciousness. You can have a thought, right? Then you can have another thought. Then if you meditate, or if you're lucky, you have no thought. And you're aware that you have no thought. You don't think, oh, I have no thought. That's not having no thought. You're just aware that there used to be thoughts in there, and now there are not. You don't have to say it to yourself. You're aware of it. So, Thoughts, where do they come from? I swear you do not need to be a neuroscientist or study this stuff, right? You know, Buddhists, ancient Buddhists studied with a source of thoughts. How? They didn't read a book. They didn't know math. They sat down. Said, All right, where do these things come from? Wonder where they're coming from. Ah, there's one. <laughs> where did it come from? And you just watch. How do you know it's, hey, I'm a weather, the best weather meteorologist ever lived, right? It's going to rain in five minutes. How do you know? Well, because I see it coming over the field and the clouds are pouring. Just look. Just look. You're in there. You're conscious. You're capable of seeing where thoughts come from. You're capable of seeing what is going on in there because you are in there. The problem is that these thoughts and these emotions, well, let's focus on thoughts for a moment, these thoughts have the ability of drawing our consciousness into them as fully as that TV screen. Now you see how I use that analogy. 
all right? Can you get lost in thought? Yes or no? Every one of you know what it means to get lost in thought. What does it mean to get lost in thought? You were out here talking to me, and then a thought started, and you went bye-bye. You weren't there anymore. You were reading a book, and you turned 16 pages, and you realize you did not read one single word on those pages. <laughs> you, you better go back 16 pages. Where were you? Oh, I the thought that I was reading about so-and-so it made me think of Anthony. Then we went, then we went out thinking, uh-oh. It's neat in it, right? You are in there. You know what it's like to be in there. And you can get lost in thoughts. Can thoughts bother you? Have you ever used the word, oh my God, this thought is bothering me so much. Who are you? You're obviously not the thought. Even your language is so right, it's so perfect. You say, the thought, that's an object, is bothering me. Something is bothering me. That means it's not me. It's bothering me. That's how we use the English language. So you intuitively describe it perfectly because you're in there experiencing it. Oh God, I'm having such nice thoughts. As I met this person, it's just my whole mind has changed. How do you know? Why are you talking like that? The answer is simple because I'm in here. I'm the consciousness. I'm the awareness of being. I used to watch thoughts that were negative, all right? Now I watch thoughts and they're really nice since I met this person. My thoughts have become nice. They're changing, all right? I used to, my thoughts always talked, they didn't like the job. I wasn't excited. I don't want to go there. I don't want to work, right? And now I got this new job and at least for one day, my thoughts, my thoughts say nice things about it, right? You're, you are aware of that. So this is the other thing that you can be aware of. Your consciousness can be distracted by anything coming into your senses, the outside world. Your consciousness can be distracted by what's coming out of your emotional heart, There's your emotions, and your consciousness can and is distracted by every single thought that pops up in your mind. What is mind? If you get lost in analyzing it, you will never find out what it is. Why? Because you're using thoughts to try to find out about thoughts. All you're going to do is learn more thoughts. You have to be willing to say, here's what you need to know about mind. It is a thought-creating machine. That's all you need to know about mind. It is a thought-creating machine. If I put it on the table over there, you know those little electronic things, you rub your hands over them and the static electricity goes to them, right? Okay, it's like one of those. You put it over there. Except if you rub your hand over it, thoughts come out. Why'd you do that? I don't like that. Why don't, look, 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 let's pop out of that little machine. All right? Except it's so used to doing it, you don't have to rub your hand over it. You just sit there and look at it. Whoa. I don't know where I want to go. I want to move up there. No, it's cold up there. I don't want to go up there. Maybe I'll go here. No, it's going to over there. I don't think it really happened. I like the desert. It's really pretty. One. Does anybody have one of those in there? <laughs> that is a thought-creating machine, isn't it? How good is yours at creating thoughts? It's <laughs> pretty good, isn't it? All right? It just creates thoughts all the time. Now, you tend to pay attention to those thoughts. Why? They're right in your face. There's another reason, too. How far do you want to go into this? You know how that TV screen when you walked in Spielberg's house caught your attention? It would not have caught your attention if it was something that you're not interested in, would it? It's, you know, it's Big Bird or something. I don't know. There's just something going on that just doesn't interest you. You're going to walk right by it, aren't you? It's not even a struggle. You don't have to renounce. It's not about renouncing. I'm going to renounce the TV screen of Big Bird. No, I'm not interested in Big Bird. I walk right past the screen. Okay? So there's a real clue. It's about you. It's not about the object. It's about the fact that the subject, you, the consciousness, gets absorbed, is interested in, is attracted to, is distracted by. Okay? So when you live in here, there are these different things, thoughts, emotions, and the world coming in, that draw your consciousness. There's two very important aspects to them. One is they're in a conspiracy. They tend to line up. The world unfolds out there. It makes certain thoughts pop up in here, which makes certain emotions go. Or the emotions start inside, which makes thoughts try to figure out why these emotions are happening. And then you look outside and try to see what the world is doing that caused the emotion that caused the thought. All right? So this whole triad of things, you're sitting there trying to deal with them. Are your thoughts interesting to you? Try to sit down and meditate and notice how hard it is to not pay attention to them. It is not true that in meditation you're supposed to stop your thoughts. I don't teach meditation. You know I don't. But let's get something straight. It is not true that in meditation you're supposed to stop your thoughts. That will not work. You'll find out later that that's a form of suppression. If there are thoughts being created in your mind, there is a reason there are thoughts being created in your mind. 
It's not random. There's a reason for it. If all you do is try to suppress the result of that reason, you're going to be there for a long time. And you're going to get ulcers, and you're going to stop meditating, and you're going to get up tight, and you're going to say, I tried it once, it didn't work for me. Because you're doing it wrong. You're not supposed to stop your thoughts. Do not ever struggle with your thoughts. There is a reason that your mind is creating the thoughts that it's creating. It is a thought-creating machine. It is not random. There's science to it. You can understand why every single thought is being created. But if what you're trying to do is say, no, I don't want that thought to be there, and you're just pushing it away, using your will to push it away, it's classic suppression and repression. It's going to come back up. It's going to build underneath. You're going to get tight. And it's meaningless, literally meaningless. I don't care if you tell me, I learned to stop my thought for five minutes. I'm not impressed at all. I've learned to stop my thought for five hours. I'm not impressed at all. I feel sorry for you. Then what is meditation? Learning to not pay attention to your thoughts. That's a totally different thing. And I mean a totally different thing. Hey, people talk, you don't pay attention to them. <laughs> you ignore people all the time. He's talking to you. Yeah, he does it all the time. <laughs> I don't hear the word he's saying. All right? You're perfectly capable of it, aren't you? Come on, you do it all the time. If you're not interested, do you know how many things go on in your life that you don't pay attention to? Everything except the one thing you're paying attention to. I only have eyes for you. There could be thousands of people in the room. <sighs> and it's not just the positive. Right? You just got divorced. You're going to a party. First one you've gone to since you got divorced, right? And you don't want him to be there or her to be there. So you look for them. <laughs> Is she here? Is she here? I get, have you seen her? But that's really brilliant. Yes, I hope you're having fun. So whatever you are interested in, you pay attention to. What you are not interested in, you don't pay attention to. That's what it's about. Now you're talking. The Buddhists say work at the root. Now you're starting to work at the root. It's not that there's anything wrong with the thought. There's a reason the thought is being created. We'll discuss it in a moment. Again, I wish you could understand it's none of your business. The world out there is none of your business. Your emotions are none of your business. Your thoughts are none of your business. Why are they none of your business? Are you doing them? Do you decide what your thoughts should say all the time? Is that what you're doing all the time? Yeah, I think I'll be neurotic for a while. I think I'll worry about what might happen tomorrow if I don't say what I thought I was going to say if I didn't say it. Oh my God, what happens if I do that? Just the thought of it freaked me out. There you go. Did you decide to do that? No, it just happens. The vast majority of your thoughts, 90, 95% of your thoughts, just pop up out of the thought making machine. Some of your thoughts don't. Two plus two, what was that? Oh yeah, oh yeah, four. You have the right to use your computer. That's what it is. It's it's the first personal computer, the one you got built in there. You have the right to use it. And you do sometimes use it. Picture a boat. Right now, a boat. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Queen Mary. (laughs) It happens, doesn't it? You have the right to use your intention, your will, to make this thought-making machine create the thoughts you want. Don't you? But that is not what you are doing. 90, 95% of the time, it is just creating its own thoughts. The driver in front of you. Oh my God, what's it? 10 miles an hour with the speed. That's just ridiculous. Why is she driving like that? What's wrong with her? Maybe she's sick. I should be nicer. No, I don't want to be nicer. You're not deciding to have those thoughts. If you think you're deciding to have the thoughts, let's see you not have them. Go on. <laughs> you're going to find out they just pop up by themselves. Very good. So I'm telling you, the world has nothing to do with you. The thoughts have nothing to do with you. And the emotions have nothing to do with you. That's shocking, isn't it? What has something to do with me? You! You, the one who's experiencing the emotion is you. The one who's experiencing the thought is you. The one who's seeing what's coming in through the senses. You are the center of awareness. You're the consciousness, the sentient being, the soul, the Atman, the core. Call it whatever you want. I don't want to give a name to it. You just tag your it. Are you in there? How do you know? Let's say the greatest scientist in the world comes out. I figured it all out. You're not in there. He said, walk away. <laughs> well, I guess you know you're in there, don't you? How long have you been in there? Were you in there when you were six? Were you aware of what was going on? Do you ever dream at night? Do you ever dream at night? Yes or no? How do you know? How do you know? I don't understand. You were sleeping. How do you know you dreamt? I saw it. Who did? Me. I saw the dream. I really did. Was it the same you who saw the dream as you who looks out through your eyes and you who notices your thoughts? Of course it is. Otherwise, when you came back, you wouldn't know anything about it. 
There's a continuity of consciousness. There's awareness of being. Do you ever not dream at night? Have you ever gone so deep, had such a deep, peaceful, quiet sleep that you woke up and said, God, I didn't have any dreams last night. I went so deep. Have you ever experienced that? How do you know? How do you know? Because you're there. Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras actually talks about that. It's an ancient yogic book. He says, consciousness is always conscious. There's never a moment, not a moment, that consciousness is not conscious. It is just a question of what it's conscious of. In the waking world, you're conscious of these things we've been talking about, right, that distract your consciousness. In the sleeping world, you're conscious of what your mind is creating without needing a stimulus from the outside world. Your mind just creates all those thoughts, doesn't it? There's no difference between your dreams and your waking, talking head. They're both things the mind is doing. It's just creating those things. But at night, you're not in the way. So it can release better. Isn't that amazing? Your mind is brilliant. It needs to release. We're getting closer to why does your mind say what it says when it says it. It needs to release energies that are stored up inside. You don't let it do it during your waking hours because they freak you out. So during your sleep, right, one type of dream you have is the releasing of these energies. So basically, you are in there and you are aware. Patanjali said that even in deep sleep, when there are no dreams or anything happening, you are still conscious. You're just conscious of nothing. That's very, very deep. When you go deep enough into meditation, you understand that. You're still there. I mean, I asked you whether you dream and I ever gone deep in meditation? So deep that the thoughts stop? How do you know? You're still there. You're just not being distracted by anything outside yourself. This is self-realization. It has to do with the fact that you have reached a state where nothing is distracting your consciousness, not any outside object, not a thought, not an emotion. If nothing is distracting my consciousness, my consciousness remains not distracted. Well, what are you aware of when there are no objects pulling your consciousness toward them? It is so holy, I can't say it. You are aware of the nature of your own being because nothing's drawing your consciousness away from it. If a flashlight falls on an object, it illumines the object. What object? The tambourine, the man, the woman, the glasses, the the wall. Whatever the object is, it illumines. That object has nothing to do with light itself. It is the light that's falling on the object and now you're paying attention to what it illumined. You're paying attention to the object. If there is no object and you turn on the flashlight in the midst of the dark night with nothing shining, anything, you see the light itself. You don't see what it illumines. Okay? And you can start to describe the nature of light instead of describing the nature of the tambourine. This is so real. It makes me shudder. Do you understand what I just said? Okay, you know what it looks like to see light shining into empty space? You, you focus on the light. But if the light is shining on an object and you're interested in the object, you're just going to describe, oh, look, now it's lit up. Look how beautiful it glows as a diamond. It's the exact same thing. When there is no object of consciousness drawing your awareness toward it, naturally, not because of struggle, naturally, then the consciousness is not drawn out of itself. And since it is conscious, it is aware of wherever it is. So it's aware of itself, and that is self-realization. That is self-actualization. Is you just as a natural state in which you are just aware of what it is like to be aware. That's what deep meditation is. You're just there, so deep, so thick. You just feel, you can't even move, you can't think. There's nothing, nothing going on. You have fallen back into the seat of self. So you're all in the seat of self. Everybody's enlightened. Every single person at this very moment is completely realized, but you're looking out, away from yourself, because you're distracted by the object of consciousness. And so now you define yourself in relationship to the object of consciousness, instead of knowing yourself as the self, as your true being. And that's just that realization of the nature of self. You start to literally experience the nature of self. I do it at the end, but I don't do it now. What do you mean? You start to feel ecstasy. What do you mean? Waves, waves, overwhelming waves of ecstasy just start flowing and pouring through your being like water being poured over you, but from the bottom up, right? Just waves over you, always, constantly. It's always going on inside. Why? Because that is the nature of self. In the ancient scriptures, they called it Satchitananda. 
eternal conscious ecstasy. It's not something you're experiencing. It is the nature of your being. You're just experiencing the nature of self. It is up with the rush of holy water, as the Bible calls it. You literally start experiencing that all the time. I don't want you to believe in God. That's just another thing the mind does or doesn't do or decides not to do or do. That's just another object of consciousness. If you let go of all that garbage, you will know what's going on. Why? Because the nature of your being is of that. See, the Bible says man was created in the image of God. There's a part of your being, I assure you, and I'm nothing to assure you, the great ones have assured you, there's a part of your being that when you fall back into the nature of your being, something pulls you up and you realize you are not who you thought you were. Just like back to the analogy we started with, you walked into that house and you sat down and you watched that TV screen. What if you get up? What if somehow somebody kicks the plug and it goes off? What happens? Instantaneously, there's the rest of the entire room. There's all the people. There's the lights. That's enlightenment. That is what's meant by enlightenment. People use the word very loosely nowadays. Please, I want you to use that word with respect. Buddha was enlightened. Christ was enlightened. You leave it alone. Okay, that includes me, all right? That's a very deep word. What it means is you have ceased to focus your consciousness on anything outside yourself, outside the nature of consciousness. So because consciousness is conscious, when it's not drawn or distracted away from itself, it knows itself as itself. It doesn't need to think about it. A thought draws it away. There's nothing higher than consciousness. Consciousness is is a miracle. What is consciousness? <laughs> it's like, I love it. The scientists sit there and say, oh, it's just more complex neurons. They don't have any idea what they're talking about. No one has ever made consciousness. They have no right to say that. Go ask the scientist when he says, next time, make me some. Here, I would like this Kleenex to know that it knows that it's a Kleenex. There's nobody's made consciousness. Right? You go back to the ancient Upanishads, the ancient teachings of every tradition, the Kabbalah, all of it. The source of consciousness is divinity. When Christ said, my father and I are one, that's why. All right? Because those who went far enough back inside, they're not being distressed. Talk about this. I didn't mean to go here. Here we are. Right? Your mind creates thoughts. I told you, it does that. You are very interested in every single thought your mind says. You're not interested in what my mind, you get so bored if I told you what my mind was saying. You know, is my hour up yet? All right? Why would you be interested in my thoughts? What happened to me when I was six and eight and ten? Boy, you think about you when you fell out of that tree, man. You, you know, you're screwed up for the next three days. Right or wrong. Why? Now you get down to where do your thoughts come from? And then you'll understand why you can't sit in the seat of self, naturally. Where do your thoughts come from? The world comes in. That's the nature of it. It stimulates your senses. It comes in. It makes an impression upon the mind. That's what it's supposed to do so that you, the consciousness, can be aware of it. You do know, you do not look out through your eyes. You have never looked out through your eyes. Light is bouncing off of objects. It is stimulating your optical nerves and it is rendering in your mind. You are seeing it in there. All of it's happening in here. So you're in here watching that. That's the purpose of the lowest part of your mind is to receive the senses so that you, the consciousness, can experience this world where you don't live. You live in here. Very good. If you did that, you would be what we call in the garden. The world would unfold, and you'd see it, and you'd experience it, and you'd have all these experiences. You'd see somebody, you'd see a flower, you'd see rain, you'd see snow, you'd see hot, you'd see cold, you'd see a rattlesnake rattling, you'd see a butterfly lands on you. All kinds of different kinds of experiences come in. And because you're experiencing them, you become a greater being. Every single thing you experience makes you a greater being because you had the experience. If I have a computer, it has some data in it. If I give it more data, it's better. So the more data you collect, if it's proper data and it's good, there's no data that's not make you better. It makes the computer better the more data it has. It's true of you too. If you experience a rattlesnake, at least you've had an experience of what a snake is like. If you experience a butterfly landing on you and then flying away and see what that's like, every single experience you have makes you a greater being. Every single experience. If the marriage did, but the divorce didn't, that's your fault. Because the marriage and the divorce are learning experiences. 
So you had a marriage that lasted 50, 60 years. Isn't that beautiful, right? I guess. But what about the person that got married three times and they had, you didn't have that experience? Who missed out? You have no idea. How many times have you had experiences you thought were the worst and they turned out to be the best in your life? They changed your life. Every single experience is like rivers flowing into the ocean. All the water is meaningful. It flows in. It makes it richer and deeper. Every single experience you have comes in. It is a gift of creation that is unfolding in front of you and it makes you a greater being because you had the experience. That's what it means to sit in the seat of self. All right. Well, why is the mind causing all this trouble? There are some experiences that have come into you that you are not okay with. They were not comfortable. The rattling rattlesnake was very scary. That's not your fault. It is scary. It's meant to be scary. The Buddhists say everything has its nature. The nature of a rattling rattlesnake is meant to scare you so that you stay away. You understand that? And other things are, are like, I saw a peacock the other day. I was visiting somebody and this peacock and it, it was, my God, what a show off. It was fully open and it was strutting around. And I was like, wow. It, and it was so beautiful, the whole thing. It was meant to be. And the rattlesnake was meant to be scary. Is everybody okay with this? Everything has a different vibration. Fine. That's none of your business. It's just rich that it came in and you got to experience it. But that's not okay with you, is it? Who? You. You who's in there. The consciousness. Right? You're not ready yet to receive it all equally. Good and bad. High and low. Dark and light. The different natures that come in that are all there to teach you. God, I, I really just want once learning to play tennis. Your backhand sucks, right? So you hire a coach. You fired four coaches so far. Why? They keep hitting it to my backhand. I told them it wasn't any good with that. Well, are you serious? That's how I want to learn to play tennis? They should hit it to your backhand, right? Life is the same way. If anything comes in and it bothers you, good. Who wants to be tough? Good. It's a beautiful experience. It's an experience. Somebody else likes it. You understand that? People like all kinds of things, right? You can't handle the backhand. So life comes in, and what do you do with it? What you do with it is as follows. You must listen to this. You resist it. What does that mean? You didn't talk about resisting. You talked about experiences coming in. If you don't let it come in, but I don't understand, it did come in. How do you not let it come in? It came in, I know. But it didn't come all the way in because you don't want it to. You don't want it to touch the core of your being, do you? You don't want that rattlesnake all the way back in there merging with you. <laughs> no, that's a bad vibration. Right? And so you do what's called resist. Resist is something you do. You. You have this power. Consciousness has a power. It does. Shakti, chi. It has power. Can you resist in there? Do you have hands in there? Can you push away thoughts? Yes or no? Can you hold emotions off? Are you in there? Can you fight with these things? Yes. You have will. That is called willpower. And that comes from the nature of self. When you concentrate consciousness, when you concentrate consciousness, it becomes a power. Just like when you hold a magnifying glass in front of the sun, it becomes a power, doesn't it? So consciousness is even everywhere. But when you concentrate it, it becomes concentrated. And it it asserts power. Consciousness is everything. It is everything. When you resist a thought, when you resist an experience, you push it away so it doesn't come all the way in and touch you. Some things you want to touch you. An intimate moment, you just melt into it, don't you? Right? You see the sunset. It's so beautiful. It blows your mind. It literally blows your mind. I love it. It, The thoughts go away and the consciousness absorbs itself. It's it's a spiritual experience, isn't it? All right. That's when you let it all the way in. But some stuff you don't let all the way in, do you? No, 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 no. This is not coming in. All right. I don't like this. And so you push it away. Where do you think it goes when you push it away? Oh, it just dissipates. No, it does not. It stays in your mind. Literally. It is a ball of energy that was passing through and you used your energy to resist it, and so that interaction stays. In yoga we call it a samskara. A samskara, that's what that is. A negative samskara. You held it back, it stays in there. Does it just sit quiet in there? You'll never see it again? Ha, 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 ha. Every single thing 
that is even remotely, abstractly associated with it will make you think of it again. You see a rope. It looks like a rattlesnake. How come ropes didn't look like rattlesnakes before you saw one doing it? You hear a baby rattle. (laughs) Am I exaggerating? Yes or no? No. Thank you. That is what happened to your mind. You broke it. You shoved all this stuff in there by holding it back. It got stuck within this thought-making machine. And I guarantee you the thoughts that are being created that happen by themselves, not the ones you do, willfully, but the ones that happen by themselves, you know, the 95%, are because of that. The ones that your creates are totally different than the ones that she creates are totally different than those create. It is because of the stuff you stored in there. Skinner said, man is the sum of his learned experiences. Not true. Your mind is the sum of your learned experiences. That I'm going to tell you. Your psyche is the sum of your learned experiences. You're the one who's in there noticing that they're the sum of your learned experiences. Have you noticed your mind tends to talk about the stuff that bothers you? Or bothered you? Does it ever talk about stuff that bothered you 30 years ago? Like when your parents got divorced when you were six, and now you're 60. What is that about? You stored it in there. It is not going to sit nicely in there. It doesn't want to be in there. It's just like your immune system tries to throw out bad stuff. Your mind does not want this stuff in there. And so the energy system within tries to push it up. But you won't let it. You push it right back down and you get weird. And to close the story to the epitome, this is what happens. It's now stored in there. It's going to make the mind think. Because it was a negative experience, it got stored with negative energy. Got stored with all the emotions and everything that's stored in there. When it comes back up, it's not going to feel good, is it? These bad experiences that you had. What's so funny is that I should have to talk about this because it seems so natural. Of course, I had bad experiences. Of course, they bother me. Wrong. There, I'm going to play shock therapy here. Wrong. If you're having a bad experience, I understand that it bothers you. If you had a bad experience, it should not be bothering you. It is over but nobody will tell you that because everything bothers everybody. (laughs) Nobody knows what it's like to be healthy. Healthy means when it is happening, you're experiencing it. Yes, I'm not going to take away from the fact that it's scary. It's a rattlesnake. This happened. My parents got divorced. It was uncomfortable when I was six. It's not uncomfortable now. Why would it be uncomfortable now? I'm 66. It doesn't make any sense. It's not even happening. How can you let something be bothering you that's not even happening? I'm challenging you. That's how people should, that's why we should talk to each other. (laughs) We should hold ourselves to a standard that's reasonable, right? The reason it is still in there is because you are keeping it in there. Do not let anyone tell you that it's natural that it be in there. It is not natural that it be in there. What is natural is be here now. What is natural is that the experience that is unfolding and coming in now is the one you're experiencing. Not that you stored this stuff in your mind. You did it. It is not natural for the mind to do it. It requires you to resist. She didn't mind that her parents got divorced. She thought it was neat. She got two fathers. So now she either doesn't bother at all when she hears the word divorce or she likes it. You, you wouldn't even get married because you're afraid you might get divorced. This is what you've done. So you've held this inside Now it gets stimulated by anything outside. It's called hit your stuff. You got buttons in there. That's what the buttons are. That's what your stuff is. It does not have to be in there, period. Now I said to you, why do you get so interested in what your mind says? Because your mind says what it says because of the stuff you stored in there. And the only reason you stored the stuff in there is because it was very interesting to you. Interesting positive or interesting negative. Therefore, when your mind says something, it is exactly perfect to get you. No one can get you more than your mind can. If somebody outside of you talked to you the way your mind talks to you, are you kidding me? They'd be in jail. You sue them. I don't know. I mean, just sit there. You shouldn't have done that. You know, you shouldn't have done that. Oh, my God, you're so stupid. You'll never know. People won't even like you. That was 20 years ago. I did that. Leave me alone. I'm so sorry. I wish I didn't do it. I know. You've been bothering me for 20 years. Wow. You're going to tolerate that? No way. No way you're not supposed to tolerate that, especially since you did it. So I covered a lot with that. So the mind talks all the time because you stored all this stuff inside of it and it's trying to release it. That's why it dreams what it dreams. I want you to get the point. I remember the day I got to the point where I realized the mind that's talking in there is exactly the same mind that creates my dreams. It just creates dreams. I don't, I'm asleep. I don't, I don't all these dreams, all these cities and things, and everything's made. 
It's the same mind that's doing all this yakety yak during the day. I like that. I don't like that. It reminds me of my mother. It just isn't as free as the dream because you know, you're not suppressing it as much, right? And so you don't pay attention to your dreams. Most of you let your dreams go when you wake up. Some of you even talk about, I had this dream, man. I was so far out. I got killed. It was so neat. You know, it's like you do all kinds of things in your dream and you let them go. You need to be that way with your waking mind. Experiences come in. You experience them. They make you a richer being because you experience them. You become a holder. You become greater. Any time a ball is hit towards your backhand, I don't care if it goes in the net, every single time you are better than you were before you hit that ball. Your muscles get stronger. Your sense of eye-hand coordination gets better. There's not a single experience you have that is not grace, that is not a blessing, that does not make you a greater being, period. If you suppress it, if you resist it, if you build it inside your mind, then your entire personality will be made out of it. Ooh, what a thing to make your personality out of. All the junk I didn't like. But you do, right? And then you will act in the outside world. Every word you say, the clothes you wear, how you wear your hair, who you hang out with is all about don't hit my stuff. <laughs> don't hit my stuff. No, I don't want to feel hurt. I want to feel secure. I want to feel good, right? And you have to work now, don't you? You have to work to be okay. You should not have to work to be okay. Your natural state is one of absolute ecstasy all the time with all these different experiences coming in, feeding, making you greater. Yes, some of them are uncomfortable. So for whatever time it is, you're uncomfortable. It's none of your business. Let's let's say you love somebody and they die. Don't giggle. You feel pain in your heart. That's good, isn't it? To have a heart that can feel pain? Would you rather not have one? They're nice things, those hearts. Right? They're like symphonies. They play for us. All right? So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with feeling a sense of loss, is there? It's beautiful. It's just, just a lot can go on here. So you get to the point where you understand that every single experience is a blessing. So you're given the gift of all these experiences. You have to learn to surrender to relax, to be open, to allow the experience to come in, to learn everything you can from it by experiencing it, not by thinking about it. 90% of the time that you think about something, you're trying to rationalize it and understand it because you don't want to experience it. Oh, I know why she said this. Oh, yeah, she probably said that because her mother did this. What are you doing? I, I don't want to experience this. I'm explaining it away. And that's what you're using your mind for. And eventually you end up with all this garbage in your mind and you don't have a nice life. And then you go out there in the outside world and you try to control and manipulate everything because you can't experience and handle stuff. So this is what's going on. So the main main thing I wanted to see is now do you see why you pay such attention to every thought you have? Because they are hand-selected by you as the the ones that are already filtered, right? You ever feel like the whole world is against you and just somehow you only have one thing that would have bothered you and it seems like it keeps happening? It's not happening. It is because that's the thing your mind is sensitive about. When you look outside, it seems like everything's related to that. You're projecting that onto the different objects. You'll see it goes like six levels. You'll see a hamburger. And it'll remind you of this, remind you of that. And the time you went to your mother, oh my God, at the time we went to the restaurant. It, nobody's, God's not doing this. Nobody's picking on you. It's, it's, you set up a system that can't work. You held inside of you everything that ever bothered you. And so now when you look outside, you see it because you're looking through the eyes of that. So the net result is, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is you've got some work to do or you've got some work to undo. I started this by saying spirituality is so misunderstood, right? There was a great Buddhist teacher who once said, spirituality is never about getting anything. It is always about losing things, getting rid of things, right? What? This stuff you stored inside. I've been doing this for a long time. The bottom line, when it's all said and done, right? You don't want that stuff in there. What? The stuff that you kept in there. You don't want it in there. You want to be able to be open and receptive and experience the beauty and awesomeness of life every second of it. You're missing most of it anyways. You might as well experience the part you're getting. You got that straight? So it comes in, you experience it, and then the next moment's there and you put your heart and soul into it and you keep experiencing and experiencing and growing and becoming greater And I'm telling you, at some point, when you let go enough of this garbage that you have inside, you will start to feel a flow of ecstasy. Yogananda said, there's a river of joy that flows within you. Find it, go there, get in, and drown. 
That's the state, all right? So life is very, very different when you stop doing what you're doing. So right now, to close it down, your mind is running your life. Why? Because you're staring at every thought you have, aren't you? All it has to do is one thought. You see somebody, you feel uncomfortable. Well, I don't want to drive this way anymore. I'll go in a different road because I don't want to see him anymore. All right? I don't, right or wrong? How weird are we? Pretty weird, isn't it? Okay? And your mind is just saying all these things. And because they're tied to your sensitive past, they're running your life. You're literally deciding everything you do based on this. And your emotions go right along with your mind. And, and the whole thing is a mess. And next thing you know, you're, what does the Bible say? Working by the sweat of your brow. That's the fall from the garden. You fell all the way out from the ecstasy down to suffering. So how do you get out? You need to find a way, and I'm not giving it to you. There are lots of techniques. There are lots of things. Every one of you are different. You have different tendencies, different natures. If you want something, I know you. You find a way to get it. If you like somebody, you find how to get their attention, don't you? It's not the same for everybody, right? You want out? You want to stay locked up in there with that junk going on in there? Or would you like to enjoy life? Every second of your life is a beautiful experience. You should wake up in the morning in ecstasy. Literally. You wake up in the morning, waves, waves of joy are just pouring through your being. You can't even open your eyes. Not because you're tired, but because it's pulling you back into it. Every single morning. That's how you should start your day. Because there's nothing blocking it. When you remove the blockages, the shakti, just the chi, just starts flowing up and it becomes the nature of your being. Every one of you can experience that. And all it's about is removing the blockages that you stored inside. That's what spiritual purification is. So how do you do that? One, here's your crash course. Stop putting more in there. Right now. That's bad stuff in there, isn't it? Causes big trouble, doesn't it? Don't put any more in there. How? Well, it's raining and you have to get out of the car. Enjoy it. But I don't enjoy it. Use affirmation. Breathe. I don't care what you do. Don't store something in there because you have to get out of the car when it's raining. Don't get mad at the rain. Don't let it be a bad experience. How could the rain be a bad experience? The car in front of you is driving slower than you like to drive. 10 miles an hour below the speed limit. Have fun with it. How? How? I told you, the mind works two ways. One, you use it, and the other, it just skews up all that you stored in there, right? Start using it. That's what affirmation is. God, look how slow she's going. If it goes really bad with me, right, because my mind's not good about that, all right? It goes really bad with me. I said, I finally go, oh my God, you're only 15 miles an hour below the speed limit? Come on, go 20. Set a world record. Come on, 25 below. Go five and a 40. Come on, you can do it. And all of a sudden, I'm having fun. I, why can't you do that? You're going to be doing it anyways. This is so stupid to just let the mind do this garbage. And then you can do it with everything. You can do it with your ex. Don't leave it in there. Why did you bother getting divorced? You didn't get divorced. It's still in there doing the same conversations over and over again. That's your fault. He could be his fault or her fault for a while when they were there, but they're not there. It can't be their fault anymore. You have to own this. And so you start working with yourself. There are lots of ways to do it. One is affirmation. Say, so, God, I... I had a hard time with this guy, and but I was married for years, and I loved him once. I really appreciate the growth I got from this. Start making your mind say something that is constructive and positive that doesn't have to be stored in there and ruin the rest of your life. If you walk away from the divorce feeling it was terrible, I'm like, you may never get married again. You may, not, you may never have a relationship again. You may never feel love again. Why should I? I know where it all goes. Love hurts. <laughs> All right? No, sit there and say, that was beautiful. And, and, and learning what I learned about human relationships and, oh, this is amazing. I'm much better off to have a, a fuller relationship than I was before. Thank you so much. Now, all of a sudden, maybe your heart can open again. You have the right to do this. In the end, in the end, you don't have to do anything. Anything. No meditation, no mantra, no positive thinking, no, no affirmation. You have to let go. Letting go is the highest thing you will ever learn. What do you mean? Well, the X comes up, let it. What's it got to do with you? It's none of your business. If you don't touch it, it will go. Remember, you're the one holding it in there. You stop holding it in there, it'll just you take a couple of waves, take a little time. It'll come up. You lean away from it. Just relax inside. Relax into the seat of where you experience it from. 
It comes up, it feels uncomfortable. How do you know? I tell you, it was all said and done. Just keep asking. How do you know it hurts? How do you know? Because I'm in here. Okay, be in there. And just relax. And if you give it room, you've let it come up. Remember, you stored it in there because you resisted it. Right? This is the path of surrender. This is the highest path there is. You just keep letting go. Letting go. And it will all go over time. You don't have to find out what it is. What if I don't even know what it is? It bothers me so much. None of your business. You are the self. You are the clear consciousness. Rest back into the seat of self. Don't push. Don't fight. Relax. Lean. The rest will all happen by itself. Just like your body can purify itself, your mind, your heart can purify themselves. They'll push it out. So spirituality is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Life is a beautiful thing. It's all very, very rich. Work on these things. Jagger.